in a world full of injustice. One bench reigned king. God, I wish I could say I was that cool. <laughs> Not a chance. Anyway, I'm building a bench. It's out of eBay. This project starts just like any other. Cutting down your rough stock, going over to the joiner, and apparently breaking stuff on the way just because you thought you were getting a cool cinematography shot. Are you guys noticing a trend yet? Now, if you've never used eBay before, it's actually a substitute for teak. Now, both of them are exotic hardwoods, and they're great for outdoor furniture because they're bug resistant, mold resistant, rot resistant. When I made this video, the cost of teak was around $40 a board foot, and the cost of ePay was around $14 a board foot. Being that they turn out pretty similar in the end, the customer decided to go with the one that was much less expensive. Now, being that both teak and ePay are exotic hardwoods, anytime you're doing a glue up, this is just a fun fact, you actually need to wipe down everything with a denatured alcohol or an acetone before you glue anything up. There's a natural oil in these woods that repels any kind of moisture and rot and mold and everything else. But to make sure there's glue adhesion, you actually need to strip out that oil before you glue anything up. So the pieces that are being glued up here are actually gonna end up being the legs, back and bottom seat stretcher components that in all honesty, the plans called for something that was at least eight quarter, but finding anything that was gonna be eight quarter of these exotic hardwoods is almost next to impossible, unless you wanna pay through the nose for it. So what you're looking at here is actually part of the glue up for the angled back piece. Ah, Lord knows, in all honesty, nobody wants to sit on a 90 degree bench because number one, it's too hot. It's a hot damn bench. And also, nobody wants to sit on a bench that's super straight and upright at 90 degrees. So making the back a little bit more economical at 12 degrees was a lot more fun and honestly, a little bit more comfortable to sit on. So to do that, rather than trying to find one piece of wood that was wide enough, I ended up actually taking two pieces, laminating them together, and the angled piece will come out of that addition. The straight leg will come out of the longer piece sitting in front of us. Once everything came out of clamps, it was getting back to what you normally do once things come out of clamps, cutting it down to its rough final size to be able to start working it. Now, if you've never worked with ePay before, this is a wood that actually has some weird characteristics. Number one, it is unbelievably dense, so it's a super heavy wood. And then number two, you can kind of see some of the dust flying off of it. If you've ever had a newborn child, you probably remember somewhere between ages zero to about six months when their child is eating nothing but milk. It tends to have kind of a, or they tend to have a little bit more of a greenish, brownish, yellowish poop color. And that's what color the dust was coming off of it. And the smell of it was kind of like dusty farts. So those of you that followed on Instagram, this is the Dusty Fart Bench. Now, as you can see on through the planer, no matter what angle we're looking at, you actually see clouds of this dust every time I put it into the machine, just come spraying out. It is a super fine dust that actually got all over the shop, but my shop literally smelled like Dusty Farts for probably two weeks, both before as this stuff was just sitting and airing out, and then afterwards as I cleaned up everything. Now back to the build. I actually had to create a template to be able to create the seat supports. And that template had to be a 36 degree, sorry, 36 inch radius. And so essentially I had to create a layout on my outfeed table and I used this massive compass that I have to create what would be part of that radius across the size piece. So I ended up using some quarter inch plywood that I had laying around from prior pieces or prior projects. And I ended up just using the bandsaw to cut it out. It actually was pretty simple. But this allowed me to make sure that all the seat supports were gonna be uniform across the entire bench so that we didn't have a little bit of bowing or sagging anywhere. Laying out the template was super easy as well. It was, sim it was as simple as tracing it out on the center line and then laying the joinery out afterwards. I ended up going back to the bandsaw just to cut this out because it was so simple on the jig, why wouldn't it be simple here? Now overall, it was, but there were so many angles and curves on this piece that I thought I was gonna end up needing a spindle sander, which, so I went out and bought it. I started out using the smaller spindle and realized that the larger one was just gonna be so much better. Take that as you will. But it made short work of smoothing things out. 
From there, I also employed the use of my card scrapers. Now, ePay, if you've never worked with it, is actually very similar to petting a dog backwards or a cat backwards. Uh, if you go anywhere other than exactly with the grain of the wood, it honestly puts splinters in your hands that are like a porcupine. So using the card scraper made it a lot easier to not get that tear out. Once everything was roughly rounded, I ended up just rounding over the edges on the router table. If you need plans for something like this, I actually got these from my buddy Mark over at Deer River Craftsman. You should check his plans out, they're fantastic. This was the point where my table saw died. Turns out I had a defective brake cartridge inside and that really slowed down my progress for the day. So I ended up switching over to the dado stack. Now what I'm cutting out here through the shaky camera is actually the insert pieces or the channels where the insert pieces will go on the back support and on the, both the top and the bottom of the back support. Here I'm actually cutting out the 12 degree angle that I had uh, that'll be on the bottom part of the back support to allow the back to be ergonomic. It was easier to do this with a single blade, keeping that angle, as you can see, it turned out just fine. Trying to do that with a dado stack wouldn't have worked the same. Then we got into the laying out of the joinery. It was just mortise and tenons throughout the entire piece, which actually made it pretty easy. I tried a few different methods, as you'll see, as to which was gonna be the most effective and efficient for cutting out some of these uh, tenons. And I found out starting with the shoulders here, working my way around the piece was definitely the most economical way to do it. It made sure that I had a hard line so I wasn't cutting into anything else. As long as you lay out the first one straight, you can follow that along pretty well. From there, I transfer those same markings onto the upper rail and once again, just rinse and repeat it. I recently picked up this speed square or smaller speed square from DFM Tools and I bought it just before WorkbenchCon and then ended up meeting the creator of DFM Tools there and he's a super nice guy. It is a Chicago based company. I would put up their quality up against anything that Woodpecker is making and it comes in at like a third of the price. Now as far as cutting the cheeks of these on the tenons, I actually found doing it this method was the best. You definitely got a cleaner cut by cutting the shoulders first and then trying to work your way to that with the Ryobi saw. I did try using a few other methods, which you'll see in a little bit, but I found this was the quickest and most efficient, and it gave me the squarest cut as well. This is where I actually tried doing the cheeks first, and I found that number one, it wasn't nearly as clean, and I ended up having a lot more overspill, if you will, onto the rest of the shoulder. It also involved a lot more cleanup. Now, because this is such a dense wood and such a hard exotic wood, I ended up actually having to sharpen my chisels and uh, any of my scrapers at least once a day, if not twice. Now, some of it was just tuning things up and you know rehoning the edge, but there was actual sharpening that had to happen every time. This wood fought me from start to finish. As I said before, there was a few methods. Coming back to cut off the shoulders after I had already cut the cheeks, I found I just kind of ran things a little further here. And you'll notice, obviously, there's a little bit of cut into some of those tenons and to the shoulders of them. It was just more efficient and more effective to start with the shoulders, get that hard line, and mark, work my way over. I then followed up each of the tenons with a chisel, made sure to square things off. And then I actually rounded off all the corners simply because it's a lot easier to round the corners on these rather than to have to square off all the miters or the mortises, sorry. I ended up using a router to cut the mortises and it just made it much easier. Now I will say coming back with the hand router sled, there's almost nothing better than knowing everything is done precisely. And yes, technically I could have used an electric router for this, probably would have been much faster, but there's something about using hand tools. It's just so much more satisfying. This is actually a Veritas uh, router plane that I had gotten on their B-Stock sale a couple of years ago. And honestly, I've been too afraid to use it up until recently because I wasn't sure how to set it up correctly, but that thing's absolutely astounding. Now I did use a plunge router to cut all the mortises in the, uh, the legs and the, the body supports. And what I found with this, it made it so much easier to lay out everything next to each other, transfer the line, so you knew everything was gonna line up when you set up the bench.
As I said before, I used a plunge router with an edge guide to be able to make all these mortises. I found if you basically plunge on each end of the, the mortise and then clean out or hog out the waste in between, it was the, the best method and most effective to make sure everything lined up correctly. The only time I had a little bit of issue was actually right here. You'll see as I'm trying to hog out some of the waste, because this is on the angled back piece, there was a little bit of slip up there. Luckily, that'll be hidden by the shoulder. Nobody will ever see it. Now for the top of the back stretchers, I wanted to make sure that they were rounded off correctly. So I hogged off a majority of the waste at the bandsaw and then actually set up my belt sander uh, strapped to the table to make sure that I could just flush sand everything because I don't have a flush sander. So I then actually went over to the table saw to make sure everything was at final width. And you'll see here there was a little bit of overlap and I cut as much as I could on the table saw then I went back over to the bandsaw to make sure that I could hog off the majority of the waste, and then I clean up the rest with the card scrapers. This is the third method that I use to cut the shoulders on the tenons. In all honesty, doing it with the table saw, yes, it works. Yes, it gets you a very even tenon. It just takes away some of the fun. The only time that it was much more effective, I had to do a 12 degree angle, and obviously trying to set that 12 degree angle by hand is a little bit tougher. So knowing that you have the backstop of the miter allows you to make sure you have a more precise fit. Once the final sizing was done on the legs, I ended up taking everything over to the router table just to round off the bottoms to make sure there were no splintering moving forward. This is the initial dry fit of the leg assemblies. As you can see, the only thing that's not done is rounding over the front of the arm parts. That's actually what we're doing here. Once again, the method was the same. Hog off the majority at the bandsaw, and then actually come back and use a uh, sander to be able to square things off or you know, flush everything up a little bit better. Now I did use the card scrapers a little more on this because it was something that obviously was gonna be touched on the regular being that it is the arm piece. So I wanted to make sure those were as clean as possible. Finally, it was time for glue up on the leg assemblies. Now, once again, you had to use denatured alcohol to clean up all the joints before you could glue them up. But the leg assemblies actually had to be glued up in two sections. The first section was going to be the lower stretchers with the legs on the front and the back. And then the arm actually comes in a little later once everything was fully dried. After glue up, it was time to clean it up again. So once again, grab the hand planes, grab the card scrapers. Everything came out clean as a whistle. Now, there was a little bit of glue squeeze out and because this was a uh, more fibrous wood, there was a little bit of tear out on here, but a little sanding took care of that. So once again, went around to every joint where they met up on the glue up, cleaned up everything with the hand plane, followed up with the card scraper, made sure it was smooth as a baby's bottom. It's a weird expression. Who goes around feeling baby's bottoms to see how smooth they are? I mean, point of reference. I'm sure not a lot of people have multiple baby's bottoms they've felt. Probably a small percentage of the community that does. Anyway, back to woodworking. So once again, following up with the card scrapers. Once everything was done there, I was able to then glue on the arms. So following up with the same process, denatured alcohol, waterproof glue, put it together, clamp it, and off we go. Once everything came out of clamps, it was time to round it all over. So I just grabbed the hand router or the palm router, followed up with an, uh, a round over bit, made sure everything was uh, once again smooth easy super easy transitions here so it made it much more comfortable chair moving forward no splinters were going to happen now it was time to start making the inserts that actually go into the back stretchers on the top and the bottom to support the back rails so these were actually laid out on some pieces that ended up having to be uh, put into two inch sections so i follow up here after laying everything out come back with a handsaw cut the initial lines it was only supposed to go a quarter inch deep. Now I ended up actually using the dado stack to hog out the majority of this, which worked really well. 
I did end up messing up this process a little bit later, which you'll see in a little bit because there's a little bit of inconsistency with the continuity of some of the footage, but we'll get to that. So I set my blade height and we were off to the races. Started out by hogging out the majority of the waist with the dado stack. And as you see, when we change camera angles in just a second, there's a little bit of height inconsistency with some of the pieces. That had to do with, more than anything, uh, what we're gonna get into in a little bit, of uh, some of the inconsistency between the plans versus what ended up happening in actuality. So you see there's a little bit longer piece behind here. I did end up making two sets of these, but the dado stack was still the much better way to go through to make sure it was all coming out even, uniform depth across the board. Not gonna lie, you folks over in Europe, you don't know what you're missing. Being able to hog out this much material this quickly and safely, yeah, it's astounding. Here's a glamour shot of what they look like. Pretty nice, isn't it? I thought so. That's why I did it more than once. Anyway, once they were done, I was able to put the standard blade back on and cut them to final width so that they fit in the slots that we had already cut on the stretchers on the top and the bottom of the back part. So, I did have to cut them to final length. It's just easier before I did the glue up. So, once again, denatured alcohol on the entire piece on both the insert as well as the cavity that they were going into. So the shorter piece in front is actually going to be the top of the back rails, and then the larger piece is going to be the bottom that has that reciprocating 12 degree angle. Now, the brad nails that I was putting in there seemed like a great idea at the time. It was gonna hold everything in place. But this, my friends, is where my troubles began. Plans called for me to cut off the excess of those supports. Uh, it ended up being a big mess. We'll get to that in a little bit. But here's some footage of cutting the what's going to be the seat slats as well as some of the back slats, cutting everything to size. Once again, coming back through, making sure everything was of correct width, cutting the initial length on and width on some of these stretchers just to make sure I had enough product to be able to test out the fit. Once everything was cut to size, I decided it was time to round over everything. So once again, grabbed the palm router, created some more dusty fart, and off we went. Obviously I had to mask up as much as possible with this product. As you can see, there's just cascades of dusty farts. But this is what the initial layout looked like once everything was first laid out just for a dry fit. Then came time to lay out the back slats. So I put them into the 12 degree slots, figured out where the center was going to be or what I thought was gonna be the center. And then I was like, oh, this is fine. I know what it's gonna be lengthwise, so I cut every one of them. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Problem was, I cut all of them about an eighth of an inch too short. As you can see, some of them are already starting to fall apart. And I was like, well, they need a little bit of securing. So I used a domino. But using the domino, I had to cut through those brad nails that I had put in there and I ruined a domino blade. It was $53 down the drain. So I went ahead and started cutting out dominoes on all the back slats. Starting out first with a 90 degree cut because that was gonna go into the top of the bench. Then I thought, hey, it's a good idea. I'm gonna cut that 12 degree angle on the back slats because it'll match the 12 degree angle that I have on the bottom rail. The problem is, as I'm cutting all these, I didn't think of the fact that when you put a 12 degree angle against an opposing 12 degree angle, it zeroes out and makes them 90 degrees. So this was a total waste of time. I was literally just doing it apparently for the fun of it. But I put everything in and as you can see, the dominoes were in the bottom. And of course I put in the wrong one first so you can't see the progression, you just see the first one sitting there. Eh, cinematography will get better, I promise. Trying to line these up was not exactly easy. Then I thought, hey, boy howdy, am I making some progress. I'm just gonna go ahead and round over all the pieces on here for the upper and lower stretchers because it makes more sense to do it beforehand rather than trying to do it after the glue up, which does make sense. So I rounded over all the back slat parts over at the router table. Then came the first full dry fit. God, I wish I could play the Benny Hill music in here. This was literally a 14 minute segment where I was trying to put in all these pieces all on my own and unfortunately, none of them lined up. This is actually after I had made the second 
set of seat supports uh, or slat supports on the rails. So these worked a little bit better, but it honestly took me quite a bit of time to try and figure these out. Clamping wasn't enough. I had to get multiple clamps to try and make sure stuff didn't fall out as I adjusted things. But this is what it ended up looking like once I took the clamps off. So clearly anyone level-headed would think, now's the best time to do the final glue up. So, grabbed the domino, grabbed the seat supports, pounded everything in, and started gluing. Because what else am I gonna do? At some point I gotta glue up this dang thing. The process was the same. Denatured alcohol, waterproof glue, rinse and repeat. Now, the only difference here is the plans called for a screw to hold everything together anywhere that there was a joint. So, rather than trying to use an ePay plug after I screwed everything in, I thought, well, let's put in a color difference. So I used the screw, put it in, and then I grabbed some white oak dowels, because they will actually weather pretty well if it's not the entire bench. But it gave it some contrast, rather than just being that strange brownish baby poop color. Then came time to do the glue up of the entire back piece. So once again, denatured alcohol, waterproof glue, I did initially try using brad nails. It was a horrible decision, had to pull those out. I ended up just kind of loose fitting these in initially. I let that dry up a little bit on my bench while I prepped the actual uh, bench with glue, obviously after denatured alcohol. So I came through, glued up each of the seat supports, and then I brought over the entire back assembly and had to fit it in. Now I was able to get one side in without a problem. Fitting the other side in was a little bit more of a chore. As you see here, it took multiple clamps and I probably broke the frame apart about five times trying to make sure everything lined up correctly. Trying to do this on your own, it's, it's difficult. This is where you need an extra set of hands or apparently more clamps. Finally, I got this thing to assemble up. Ah, a little bit more persuasion, there we go. Took off the seat slats, ended up putting it up on its side because the plans called for a dowel to go into everywhere that there was a mortise and tenon joint. They wanted a dowel through the tenon, but not all the way through the bench. So, had to take off that side uh, support, put everything back on, clamp everything back up, and then come through and put a dowel into each joint. So you can see here, it's the same process that we used before. Marking out where the center of that uh, tenon was, drilling it out, putting in an oak dowel, cutting it a little long to be able to pound it in further, cutting off the excess, and then using the rest of that cutoff in the next piece. Now that everything was at final length and the frame of it was all glued up, it was time to focus back on the seat slats. So I took the palm router, rounded over the edges to make sure there were no splinters. I did give a little bit of a recess in here just for a design aspect. And then I came back and sanded everything up to 300 grit. The plans did call for eyeballing the spacing on these slats, but I found that using a fingertip width was actually probably the most appealing and the most even. So I literally would clamp it on one side, make sure it was even on the next side, come over and there we were. Then I followed up, just drew a line on the seat supports and ended up marking center and came in and did the same thing with the dowels. I did not end up gluing these seat supports in case I have to change them out at any point in the future. It's just gonna be easier rather than having to fight the glue to just drill out a little bit of a dowel, pull out a screw and put on a new piece. This is also where my camera died shortly after here. I essentially ran out of memory on this entire build and didn't end up getting footage of any of this finishing or the actual finishing of the piece, but here it is in all of its glory. Three coats of teak oil on there. To me, it looks absolutely astounding and so much better than it did when it was just raw lumber. I'm honestly really pleased with how this turned out. I was skeptical when I saw the initial color of the wood, but this is it in its final place at the customer's house, out in their garden, out in front of a fire pit. It looked astounding. If you guys liked what you saw, feel free to subscribe. If you didn't, feel free to subscribe anyway. That'd be nice of you. Have an awesome day.